From Los Angeles, the home of film and television, this is Film Music Live, a webcast featuring outstanding composers, orchestrators, filmmakers, and more from the world of music for film, television, and video games, talking about their work and answering your questions. Film Music Live is sponsored by the Film Music Network and Film Music Institute. And now the host of Film Music Live, Daniel Schweiger. Hey everyone, I'm Daniel Schweiger, and welcome to Film Music Live, the show where you get to ask the questions to today's top composers. I'm happy to have you here. Perhaps no sex and drug desiring kids from the 1990s have shown the timelessness of how hilariously smart it can be when you're beyond stupid like Beavis and Butthead. Launching the satirical empire of creator Mike Judge into the stratosphere when the chortling heavy metal teens appeared on MTV to make mincemeat of rock videos. It was one giant step for wannabe mankind when they got their first big screen movie with 1996's Beavis and Butthead Do America. The composer who had the brainstorm to stay away from rock and roll and treat their White House shattering adventures with a humorously over-the-top orchestra was the upcoming composer and Beavis superfan John Frizzell. Showing how hilariously playing it straight could be, Beavis helped launch Frizzell into a whole new stratosphere of aliens, exploding volcanoes, pissed-off ghosts, and angry angels. Just as importantly, he'd begin a rocking collaboration with Judge that would encompass his first live-action cult classic, Office Space, then accompany Judge's animated antics with King of the Hill and Tales from the Tour Bus. Now, after playing a patriotic mission control of boobs with the second season of Netflix's Space Force, Frizzell truly goes where no band of idiots has gone before with Beavis and Butthead Do the Universe. It's a massively scored return to sillily serious form for Judge's iconic characters via Paramount+. Plus. For where John Frizzell had played America like a disaster film, he now sucks up to space as if this was a score to a sequel for the right stuff. It's beyond symphonic music that unleashes self-important patriotism, soaring noble emotion, and theremin menace right out of a 1950 space invasion flick. You could imagine this playing any other movie beside one with Beavis and Butthead, which is exactly the brilliant point for one of John Frizzell's most impressive works in the service of Mike Judge's eternally popular boneheads. And now let's welcome a composer who's seriously taken Beavis and Butthead from America's boob tube to the universe's ultimate cornholio. Welcome, John Frizzell. Hey, Daniel. Wow, what an intro. Thank you. <laughs> it's I great having you here. That's really beautifully written, and thank you so much for all that. I just wish it was written by Mike Judge because he would he would have done it better. <laughs> what when I mean you know this was really early, super early on in your career when you scored uh, Beavis and Butthead Do America, but do you remember the first time that you ever saw Beavis and Butthead and what struck you about them? I think I I think I maybe saw a T-shirt or something first. I I, I don't actually really remember my first encounter. Um, but I, very shortly after, I did watch the show and was just completely felt at home and saw a lot of myself and in, in the two of them and had to, uh, you know, just got completely sucked in and addicted to watching it, watched everything. And I think you're probably like in your early 20s uh, when it uh, first hit MTV. Yeah. What year did it what year did it hit? It was at 92. Like frog that... Baseball. Yeah. Ar yeah. Around there. Yeah. So um, I was born in 66. So we can, uh, Beavis and Butthead could probably figure out the math on that, right? <laughs> um, so you must have the world's best audition to score Beavis and Butthead to America. You mean uh, that's your, audition, your audition tape? How, 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 where, where did you come oh, up yeah, with the idea yeah. for that? Yeah. Well, I figured I had, you know, I had to get some sort of, way to get past i had no credits really at the time and i and i was so passionate i knew i could figure out some cool way to do the film but so i had one of those there was a beavis and butthead remote control i don't know if you remember that but there was and it had all their little sayings on it so i i recorded that and i i back then we had our samplers you know i think they had like one megabyte of ram in them um and uh but i but i got i got it sampled in there and then i edited it so it sounded like they were 
destroying my music, but they just detested me. And um, it was a lot of fun to make. And, I, you know, cracked up Mike, I guess. So got the door open. Now, I want to tell everyone uh, send in your questions for the first five people who actually live in America or idiocracy, as I like to call it. We've got a physical, remember physical CDs, Beavis and Butthead Do America, expanded edition to send your way. Um, so what was it about Beavis and Butthead Do America? You know, this is obviously leaping off from the television where it was done, you know, deliberately, crudely to the big screen. What, what was it that made you think that your pitch was going to be, OK, we're going to score this with a massive symphony. We're going to totally take this seriously no rock and roll music well it would i guess it was in my head i i kept imagining so how do we get them from the screen to make the movie a different experience not just a big tv show how do you make the the, the do america how do you create that as a, a, an event unto itself that stands apart and um when i saw the story that Mike had in mind. I heard a little blurb about it. I think this is before, obviously before I was hired to do, do America. I, I just sort of doubled down on the idea that you had to go all out with it, with a big orchestra on it. Um, that it would just sit against them so well to have, you know, look at them. Let's just take them in. <laughs> hey boys, you know, and, and just that they would, that, that, that just them with an orchestra would just made me laugh. I mean, maybe it goes back to things I grew up listening to is, you know, being a big Monty Python fan as I, I, I always loved the way uh, orchestra was used in sort of this uber serious kind of way in Monty Python. Um, I'm trying to think if there's other references, but, but that, 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 you know, I knew every, everything Monty Python. So um, that probably influenced me. And you were friends with Elmer Bernstein, who really was the composer who popularized, you know, doing a big, massive, over-the-top score, you know, stuff like Animal House, you know, obviously Airplane, which really made that whole kind of genre of scoring take off. Well, yes, conversations with Elmer, I mean, um, were, were really key. Once I had the idea of going with an orchestra about, well, how do you do that now? How do you, how do you make it work? And um, Elmer invited me up to Santa Barbara when I told him I was hired. Oh, he said, you know, we had to have lunch immediately. And uh, it was just so wonderful. And, and I drove up there and, and um, had lunch with Elmer. And we, we talked a lot about um, Animal House and Stripes and, and, uh, and Ghostbusters. Yeah, and, we, and uh, Airplane. And, um, and, and just about this position, this sort of psychological place that he said to put yourself in when doing this is to imagine that you're this composer who um, ha has a lot of chops, but really kind of wants to show them off a lot, like a little more than you probably should. You don't quite get the jokes, but you're, you're kind of trying to just bring attention to yourself a little bit more than you should. Anyway, to sort of wear that hat, to sort of design this persona as a, as a composer and just sort of you know, put that hat on your head when you're writing. That was that was sort of the the idea from Elmer about how he told me he approached comedy, and I I did that. I I had developed this sort of alter ego in my mind of this character that I would be when I was scoring it, and and just sort of wrote from that position, and uh, seemed to be effective. You know, so so um, a lot of thanks to Elmer, and it was very important to me as someone who values the, the, the history of film scoring to, to find the legacies, to find these legacy ideas and to keep them going through, flowing through cinema today. So, um, yeah. So let's go to our first question. It's from Louis Versolini. Um, now, he's a big fan of all your work, and his question is, when scoring Beavis and Butthead to America, how did you arrive at the decision to score the live-action blockbuster movie versus just a typical comedy? What's that kind of extra secret sauce, I guess, when you're you know, choosing your instrument and your orchestration uh, to really go completely over the top? Well, some of it was, if you just look at the Butt Kong sequence, is uh, I, I had to just get the dynamically to pull the orchestra into a place that was beyond what you expected at that era in 96 is that as i think that that as acting 
maybe became a little more subdued as, as close-ups became more part of uh, the cinematic language. I think you can look at the evolution of film music and see that it became more subtle and more subdued and less brash and less strident and, and, and less overt. And so I reverted back to uh, the earlier ideas of, of these more overt statements, but still having them, trying to keep them still very serious sounding. Um, but, but, but to sort of lose that modern sensibility, maybe is that, is that make sense? I'd say pretty much. Yeah. I love how there's a tip of the butt Kong theme hat uh, to uh, do the universe's opening. Yeah. You yeah. That. yeah. We got, we, we, we put that in there. Um, Mike and I had a discussion about that and we decided that was the one musical idea to bring forward into this film. So here's a question from uh, James and Anthony Phillips jumping right into Do the Universe. I mean, one thing I absolutely loved about it was what, uh, what appeared to be a theremin in there. And I guess maybe specifically to Do the Universe, he'd love to know what instruments do you use for a comedy? And in particular, uh, Beavis and Butthead Do the Universe. Wow. Um, well, if we say what instruments do you use for a comedy, then we could have a discussion about Office Space because Office Space stands way apart from Beavis. But for both the Beavis films, um, traditional orchestra uh, has so far been the thing. If there's someday another one, I don't know until I get there. Um, but uh, that really it's about, in this score, Do the Universe, is not only is it about the orchestra, but it was about a lot of different solos coming from the orchestra. To really find a moment for every, I think I, got, I covered most of the orchestra. I don't think I have a violin solo, but I have a lot of solos in here. And I'd really tried to give everybody a big moment so you could hear, um, you could really get, get inside an instrument and really get it to emote and express and clearly make a musical statement that again, wouldn't necessarily be in the context of what you would expect today in a film score. So is it actually theremin? Well, no. Um, it's not. Um, I experimented with a whole bunch of different ways of, do, of, of doing the sound. And I just, I liked this sort of quasi, I controlled a theremin from a keyboard. So I guess you can't call it. I didn't control it with my hands. So I tried all sorts of different variations, but this was the sound that just worked. So it's an electronic sound controlled from a keyboard that is of that ilk. Now, what, you know, going back to uh, Beavis and Butthead Do America, what struck you about Mike Judge? I mean, what do you think made him different from maybe another director you would have worked with just in terms of his whole approach to comedy? Well, that's a, that's a really good question. It's very hard to, to verbalize as to what really, how do you sum up Mike's humor in an idea? Maybe there's just some way that Mike and I see the humorous part of being of, of life together, that we just see this, that we just see the same things as funny. Um, that, that is really very hard to articulate it. It really, you know, I think we're going outside of the range of language in that is that, um, but the things that, that Mike thinks are funny, I think are funny too. And, and I guess just two people happen to bump into each other that, that, found the same things funny. And, and luckily, and I think what's ex nice to see is that the world uh, is enjoying this film. People are really enjoying it and they're laughing a lot. And so I guess the things we think are funny, a lot of people think are funny. Now in uh, Do America, they keep uh, running into and humiliating a character who is not Henry Hill, but would definitely give rise to Henry Hill and King of the Hill, which you did a bunch of uh, scoring for. And that brings us to our question from Eric. Uh, King of the Hill is my favorite show. I lived in Texas. Now I live in Oklahoma. So I've met all the character archetypes. Uh, were there any challenges in treating characters like Hank so earnestly? Well, my family's from Texas. Um, my father was born in um, in mid near Midland, and then my grandfather was a was a country doctor out near Buffalo Gap and Abilene area. I guess covered different areas around out there. Um, so for me, I I knew all my cousins when I was growing up were very much uh, you know had a lot of I was around a lot of Texas. So maybe a lot of these humors come from that. A lot of the humor, or maybe my connection to to Hank Hill came from that. Um, my father didn't want to think of himself as a Texan. 
and and did everything he could to lose his accent accent uh, but you'd hear it come out now and then but there was a lot of just texas humor and texas jokes and around the house growing up so maybe maybe i just grew up with understanding who hank really is and these archetypes they are really archetypes i think too um but i think that the, what's beautiful about the king of the hill characters is that while they are texan they're, they're human archetypes and they go beyond uh just simply uh that they do have their texasness to them but they also go beyond that too that's what makes the characters really stick what was it like segueing uh with mike into live action with office space yeah uh, office space is was a very tricky film to score um and i, I almost think it was funny because i was thinking this morning i was listening to some things from space force and i think i finally figured out the sound i should have put in office space about 22 years late but um <laughs> you know it, it um it the when we were spotting office space we knew the film needed a score but there was no one scene that absolutely had to have a score had to have score in it, it was, every scene would sort of play but the film really needed it as a whole so almost had to go in and impose music on a scene that didn't necessarily scream out for it and um and it made it very difficult to know if I was hitting the right spots, if I was really going in and, and, and augmenting the film in the right way. So um, that was a, a very challenging score to write. I mean, were, did you have any idea that it would become like this incredible cult movie that would just become like one of the most quotable films of all time, uh, you know, and essentially doing that kind of dance musically with the words in the script? I had no, I really didn't have any idea. When we were making Office Space, I was absolutely in, enamored and in love with the film and loved everything about it and, and was sure that we were making something that the, that the world would embrace and enjoy. And the release of the film was just really quite devastating. It was, um, it was hard for me to understand why it had not gone anywhere. Um, and it, uh, it took maybe a couple years and and then... I think a couple years later, I was having lunch and um, the person waiting on the table looked at my credit card and said, you scored office space. And I said, how would you possibly know that? No one knows my name. It's ridiculous. You know, and, it, and, and the person said that they had watched the film, um, you know, so many times that they just recognized my name. And that's when I realized that something was going on and office space really started to grow. And it started to just show up and then there was just more about office space until it's now become what it is today. And like you're saying, it's it's really one of those comedies that everybody knows. There's so many lines, there's so many cultural jokes that you can just say that all come from office space. It's it's amazing how it but it took so much time for that to happen, for it to grow. How much flair did your server have? I have, yeah, I'm very flare light today, but um, <laughs> But was the server wearing flare? Because that was the yeah. Most, that's the most yeah. That's right. Yeah. No, I don't. I think I think we're it was a flareless environment. One thing I really love about the Office Space score is that it really kind of captures the idea of time and ticking and pressure. Uh, as a composer, I mean, did you draw on that kind of stuff when you're up against a deadline, or maybe a smarmy director just people you just didn't like working with on a movie? And how do you kind of satirize that for uh, Daniel? That's a really nice way of, of looking at the score. And yeah, I think that maybe what I, I latched onto was just sort of the. The, the caper aspect of the film was this, as a composer, was the best part of the film to latch onto for the score. And to if I could keep the caper kind of exciting and going along, then that would keep it going. But um, but yeah, I, I, I do have some new ideas for Office Space. I don't know what to do with them, but uh, <laughs> they're just percolating around me. I don't really ever finish writing anything. I just I usually just get more ideas later. If I watch the film later, I go, oh, I have an idea for this scene now. You know, so now jumping around your career a bit, um, a question from Ivan Sorkin uh, with Alien Resurrection, you return to the classic themes from Jerry Goldsmith very skillfully. What were your feelings that you could work with the Maestro's material in that particular score? Well, I, the, 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 his themes are unchanged in there. We, we um, pulled, we got the actual scores and just, and they're just recorded. So they fit in there. Maybe it's the recording techniques, but um, I wouldn't ever feel comfortable 
changing his amazing work. So, yeah, there as is. How did you, how, you know, when you're scoring a kind of, and you've done a couple of franchise things, how do how you decide, okay, this is where we have the theme, or this is where we bring, we have this kind of throwback in the midst of an original score? How do you pick and choose where that kind of stuff happens? Say it one more time. Like, what, what do you mean? Well, I guess, you know, when you're doing a sequel score, oh, um, okay. you know, how do you choose where to kind of bring back the iconic music as it, as it were? Like, how do you choose, pick and choose those moments as to where that composer's theme will live with your original music? I think you have to think structurally uh, about what, I mean, I, I'm trying to think of exam of specific examples. I don't have a lot of good ones for you. Um, but, but the way I tend to, I tend to look at a scene and to think of it structurally in the film from several different directions. I'm, I'm, um, one of the things I, I, I look is the hero's journey is to kind of think of it as this character that goes, usually you have a character that goes outside of what their, their comfort zone. They meet various people along the way, uh, helpers and hinderers, and they reach this sort of bottom and then they had this moment of truth and they come back and then they overcome something and then they come back to their usually an original place, but they're transformed in some ways. And so one of the things I do is I look at a film from this Joseph Campbell perspective um, to, to try to, even if the writer didn't mean to impose these Joseph Campbell type ideas, I try to dig them out of anything I'm working on so that I can embed structural elements into the score to drive the story. Does that make sense? You see what I mean? Is, is I, as I really look for these key moments in a film. And the other thing um, is I look at each scene from the perspective of, of, uh, of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, I think John Powell um, came up with this idea and told me about it. And then I was like, wow, that's really brilliant. I mean, John's so brilliant. And, and then, um, so, so in other words, in any scene, I have to decide what someone needs. Now, the biggest need we all have is air, because uh, you can very, you can only last a very short period of time without air. Um, and I've actually scored, there's actually a scene in Alien Resurrection, where they're underwater, they need air. So that that would be a level one need, right? And then you can get to a level two, which is, you know, water, food, safety, warmth, um, then you get to these higher needs like um, personal growth or, or spiritual growth and personal love. Um, and, and I think it's very helpful as a composer to think of what is needed in each scene. And that that's the biggest thing I look for uh, in, in, in figuring out the tone of the score for a scene in a film. That balance with this sort of Joseph Campbell idea of where we sit structurally in a story in the archetype of a story. I mean, and if you want to apply that to Beavis and Butthead do America, again, you have this glorious kind of Hollywood ending as they finally get their television set. Absolutely. He's exactly right. In other words, that's, that's the, that is the, um, the full culmination of desire there, right? That would be, that would be in, 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 a, in a Beavis and Butthead world. That's the, the att the attainment of the highest need. I mean, it's of of having your television. Yeah, yeah, and that's and exactly how I scored it. So that's the, and that's how it's so ridiculous. You know. Now that brings us to a question from Lone Star, and again, I think your second biggest cult movie, which is, um, you know, you've written so many thriller and horror scores, but do you find it easier or harder working on comedies like Office Space and the delightful Josie and the Pussycats? I hear more about Josie and the Pussycats these days than just about anything I've ever written. And very much like Office Space. I don't know why my life is like this, but I just, that was another film that I was sure everyone was going to get the joke because um, what Deb and Harry wrote is just so brilliant and clever and insightful. Um, and no one got it at the time. No one could see that, that this was a, that, they were prophesizing what was about to happen with technology and what was about to happen with privacy and all sorts of things. Um, and, and, and approached it in a very, very clever and funny way in just a very clever, humorous way. So um, yeah. Yeah. Josie and the Pussycats 
um, it's amazing how it's it's come around. There's been I got in some discussions recently with a team that would, you know, it, it could make a musical. It could all sorts of things could happen with Josie and the Pussycats. And um, yeah, it's it's really strange though that that those two films had such sleepy beginnings and and just later came into their own. Now, getting back into a Beavis and Butthead do the universe, um, you scored the second season of Space uh, Force on Netflix, which I thought was hilarious, actually even better uh, than the first time out. How did that inform you as kind of their, similar themes would come into play with the uh, Beavis and Butthead do the universe? It was just kind of funny that I'd never dealt with space before. And then so for the last year of my life, I've been dealing with space in film. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, it was just, it was just a strange coincidence and working with Greg Daniels, um, who we had such a great time working on, on King of the Hill, loved the team on, um, Space Force and had a, had a really great time. Uh, I think it was good that I had that bit of time where I was dealing with snare drums and a slightly martial or military type sound, but in a playful kind of way. There's not that much of that really in uh, Do the Universe. There's a there's a few little moments, the training montage, and things. But uh, but it was an interesting overlap. I think there was a sentiment of of I'm I'm looking for the right word. It's sort of I think risking your life to go to space is is such an incredibly noble and brave act um, that there's that there's some awe that we look at when we think of someone climbing into uh, one of these amazing machines and going outside of what is everything, you know, what, what the, 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 the inside the atmosphere is where we are supposed to be. Um, and to, to go beyond that is, is such a cool idea. I got, I would, I would love to do it. You know, you could say that the music for Beavis and Butthead was about pursuit, panic, and disaster. But this is actually a much more of an emotional score overall. And there's really, again, a sense of patriotism, of nobility, of sacrifice, all of which are completely above these characters' heads. But do, do you think that's true with, with this one? That it has these, these types of themes? Yeah, or just a, a more, a much more of a kind of a patriotic approach and just kind of like a nobleness to this particular score. I would go much more with the nobleness. I, I, I'd, I don't see it particularly in the former sense, but um, the, uh, but I, but I do think that it's more about um, the characters, the other astronauts, that, that why they're going. You know, if we look at their sentiment for what they're trying to do. And then they get stuck with these two up there. Um, so I think my score is more for the other astronauts as to what their experience is and what they've gone through, the, the challenges that they've faced to get to space and, and the life and death situation they end up in. You know, and then, then Beavis and Butt had happened to be there, which is how the humor comes out, I think, in the, uh, in the, in the, in the score, that it's just not acknowledging that, that the two biggest idiots that have ever existed are right there all along. You know, being as obviously smart as you are, is it difficult to write for completely stupid characters? Well, I don't. I mean, smart. I don't know. I, I'm good at maybe at, at some one thing or something. But talk to my family; they might disagree if I'm smart. But the um, uh, no, I mean, Beavis. I just feel. I think writing for Beavis and working with Mike is, is very, very natural place for me i mean um there's something about their stupidity that um that i just feel really close to <laughs> I, I i'm i'll say that i just i guess i'm proud of that i just i i think like them in a lot of ways i guess um i feel a, 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 an affection for them i feel a, a need for them i feel like the, the the laughter that they bring is just good for everybody um, I, I really adore them. I adore them. They're, they're like, they're like family, you know, the boys. I mean, you've obviously scored, I mean, in every which way, but I mean, how do you want, how do you want to play? I mean, with every, the, 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 the pinnacle, the, the unattainable is to score. How do you play that just impossible dream of 
wanting to score. Of uh, uh, which score are you talking about? Oh, oh score for Beavis and Butthead. Just yeah, literally yeah. score. Well, I mean, I, I think you just have to look at the the Dave that in their teenage little minds, the way they've. I, you can you can get very intellectual about this, which is probably completely the wrong thing to do. And think about sort of their they're growing up. They're 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 growing up from being kids. They're probably not going to grow up. But theoretically, you're supposed to, right? And um, and so that they've they've just put their desire to score in this into this realm of the unattainable, um, and that's just funny. It's just funny to have them think of it that way, the way they think of it. It's so far removed from from what is probably a useful and healthy way uh, to to think of the subject. And um, yeah, so it's 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 just crazy funny because. I think a lot of people can relate to it. That's the key is that, is that I think that the reason so many people find it funny is that you relate to it. Uh, I mean, it was pretty cool that the animation this time was actually better than um, Beavis and Butthead do America. I mean, did that strike you? And if it did, how did it play into the score that this was a better animated movie? I mean, I do. I love do America. I, I think different is more of a turn I'm going to go with. I think I think Do America had the perfect look for what the story was. I mean, if you look at the uh, the, the scene in the desert, the hallucination sequence, that's some of the coolest, uh, most elaborate animation. It's amazing animation in there. I mean, so many amazing scenes. Um, uh, I think there is a tone, an animation tone in this, and I think that that is perfectly suited to the story. And it it really fits the story. And um, Titmouse Animation just nailed it. They under they got the tone, and and obviously Mike leading the team. Um, but but that was the key. I don't even know. I know so little about the technicalities of animation. Um, I don't know what those things are that made it really so different and made it so unique. Um, that why do the universe has such a different tone than do America. I couldn't really describe it technically, but I do think that the neither is better. I think that they're perfectly suited to each story. Now I've got a question from Dale. Um, how did you come to work on the recent Frank Zappa documentary? And what was it like working with Alex Winter of Bill and Ted? Oh, I'm, I'm really happy to talk about that. Um, uh, well, I loved working with Alex Winter and Alex had a, uh, a masterful vision of what story we needed to tell about Zappa's life. Um, I also think Zappa would really like uh, do the universe. Um, so uh, there's, there's that out there. Um, but anyway, back to that film is uh, I was asked to work on the film and I was really, really nervous to write music about, Zappa's life that would correlate with him um, just because I have so much admiration for his precision and his musicality I felt like I didn't know what I would start with that would represent what he what he would would, would he would look at it and like it I mean it was really the most intimidating thing about it um, and Alex and I talked a fair amount about how Zappa felt about film music. And I learned that he really loved film music and understood that, that film music wasn't like the type of music he wrote and that, and that film music had to simplify down and serve a, serve a different function and you know not have such a um, complex, often intellectual, uh, I guess in the, it, it had to put its intellectual ideas sort of in the background and be s second to what story it's telling. And once I really got into that idea, talking to Alex, uh, the score started to flow very quickly. And I really love that score. I love that film. I, I'm very, very proud to have been a part and very grateful to get to tell Frank's story and to bring some permanence to that part of his story, his orchestral writing in the film. So I hope everyone gets to see it. It's really good.
I mean, do you think there's kind of like a Mary Prankster quality that links Mike Judge and Frank Zappa in the way? Because, again, Mike Judge, again, he's like Jonathan Swift and just how amazingly he's predicted the complete collapse of America and just the downfall of society in general. Uh, I mean, like idiocracy literally is like reading a tome from Nostradamus. Uh, and again, Frank was a guy, again, a really wonderful kind of rock satirist. Do, do you see a link between them? There really, there really is, uh, you're really drawing an interesting connection there. And the connection to Jonathan Swift, I think, is really important to point out, too, is that, um, that, that, that the satire um, and the skill and the ability to satire really well is, uh, it's a really critical thing, I think, socially to have good satire going on. Um, obviously, we were living in pretty strange times these days. Um, and satire... I think is 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 a very powerful and useful tool, and um, it it it's like holding up a mirror. Uh, it's like a funhouse mirror that you can hold up to the world and look in this strange mirror, and you see things. And when you can see who we're choosing to be through these strange mirrors, maybe it lets us look into ourselves in a different way, and maybe the laughter allows us to look in a little deeper too. Uh, I still go back and read Swift. I'm I'm obsessed with. Uh, you know, I've used terminology from Gulliver's and tra Gulliver's Travels and a lot of my businesses and things like that. Um, and, and just fascinated with the whole story. I, I was just reading A Modest Proposal the other day and really it was cracking me up because it's so twisted. Um, and obviously, you know, when it comes to rock and roll and Mike, uh, you scored uh, Tales from the Tour Bus. I think it's in its second or its third season now. Uh, what was that experience like? We did two seasons of Tour Bus. Um, and so season one is the history of outlaw country music. And if, if I really recommend people check it out, it's a, it's an incredible show. It, it didn't get, um, uh, commercially out there probably in 10 years, it'll be, you know, the number one show on TV. It's probably going to be like, <laughs> right. Just sort of go that route again. Um, and, and there was just, and that was a really great experience for me, um, to get to know more about uh, out, the history of outlaw country music. Um, I'm a big bluegrass fan and play a lot of bluegrass, but I, I did have some really big holes in how I understood how this music had evolved. And so it was, I learned a ton doing it. Um, and then season two, um, you know, we did the history of funk. And so I got to work with uh, George Clinton. And for me, that was, uh, I can't even begin to tell you how unbelievably cool that was to get to know George and to work with P-Funk as the band and um, to tell the story of, to be part of telling that story of the music. Um, it was just amazing. Just amazing. Now, going back to Louis, um, actually, one of the really cool CD releases that came out recently was the Vares Sarah Band Club putting out a double CD of Dante's Peak. Uh, really one of really a great, literally explosive score early on. And Louis would love to know, um, how were you originally introduced to James Newton Howard and what type of impact did he have on your first two feature films, The Rich Man's Wife and Dante's Peak? Well, OK, so the first part of the question um... I met James, uh, I was work. I was in New York. I was doing, uh, jingles. I was doing commercials and I, I, I was in my early twenties and I kind of got a, a reputation for writing commercials when people needed it to sound like a movie. Um, and I'd never really thought about being a film composer, but all of a sudden I found myself getting hired over and over and over to make commercials that sounded like movies. And I started listening to scores a lot more. And the, the composer that really stuck out to me above everybody else was James Newton Howard. And then um, the, the company that I worked at um, had some interactions with James and I met him briefly there. Um, and I told him I really wanted to be a film composer. And, um, and I just kept sort of maybe being annoying, um, uh, but I was very persistent and um, then I, an opportunity came up for us to work together on uh, on the rich man's wife, and James wrote a theme, and the theme really was was I think the core of the film uh, and the score, 
uh, and really held it together. And that process went well. And that was the same process that went on for Dante's Peak. And again, uh, James's themes in Dante's Peak are just so fundamental to the score that that uh, they're really they're really the driving force behind it. So, uh, and I think that maybe points to one of the most important ideas that James taught me is it's so much easier to score a film when you work with a really strong idea as a composer. Um, you, I hear all scores, and I won't name them, but I do hear scores where there's a lot of polish on something that wasn't that developed, where you hear, uh, you know, brilliant production, nice playing and everything, but the, 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 the core idea, and not even the big thematic ideas, but, um, but I do hear scores where the, you don't really start with a strong idea. Um, it's just easier, I think, as a composer, and that's uh, something that James really embedded in me to understand is that it's just that's the way you start a cue. Start with a really strong idea and um, it'll expand out. It just unfolds. It's just it's got strength. It's got legs. It's got structure. And and this is all, you know, really about I think we're getting into talking really about what music, in fact, is um, and these what makes a piece of music strong is something very tied into what makes us human. I, I, you know, I think we're strongly connected to what music is. And I, you know, it's a fascinating subject to get into is like, what is music? Where does it even come from? Why do we like to organize pitches in a way that make us feel things? I don't know, but it's a great subject. Um, did that, that kind of give you the idea? Absolutely. I mean, and another really remarkable composer that you collaborated with early on in your career was uh, Ryuichi Sakamoto. Yeah, well, and Ryuichi was, that was the first time I ever worked on um, anything long form. And that was before I met James. Um, I, there was a, it was an odd story about how that came about. I uh got a call from a buddy of mine named Gil Goldstein, who was supposed to work with Ryuichi on a mini series called Wild Palms that Oliver Stone made. And Gil, amazing piano player, all of a sudden, I think he was, he was going on the road with Pat Metheny because something was going, I forget what, I forget all the details, but anyway, uh, Lyle Mays wasn't going on the road with Pat Metheny and Gil was, and Gil needed me to replace him with Sakamoto and I met Ryuichi and we hit it off and away we went. And I think we spent about three months working on Wild Palms, which is a very, very strange, uh, fascinating story. I haven't seen it in probably 15 or 20 years, um, but it's a really cool, uh, hard to follow maybe, but a very interesting and weird experience. And um, and so that was, I got to take Ryuichi's music and synthestrate it maybe. We didn't use a live orchestra on the film, on the ser mini series, but I, I took his music and would expand and change cues and modify them and did all sorts of stuff. And so that was my first time out of the gate working with one of the real great masters of film scoring. Um, and I uh, was really lucky for that experience. Yeah, you know, I, I vividly uh, remember Wild Palms. It was a really pretty great miniseries and, again, kind of prophetic. And the other re a really early TV show that you scored that was another prophetic show was uh, VR5. Yeah, VR5. Um, you don't hear too much about VR5, but but um, it was a bit, uh, I think, a show that was ahead of its time. For those of you who don't know, it was a show, I think it was 94, Daniel, is that right? 94? Something like that, yeah, I'll dig yeah. it up. <laughs> it was about virtual reality, and it was about sort of the, the sort of the pitfalls of getting too far into virtual reality. Um, and uh, it was very interesting. So John Sacred Young created the show, and I got to write a very strange score just really weird stuff they would the, the, the you know be in very eclectic and odd environments with these virtual reality situations so yeah that was a fun show very short-lived show uh, i don't think we made it past 10 episodes 12 episodes or something but but it was it was a cool experience but i mean talk about strange again another really noteworthy early score you did in one of the strangest films i think that's ever come out is the empty mirror oh wow you do bring up some memories Yes, The Empty Mirror, um, which is a, a film, uh, it sort of takes place, again, it's very esoteric in how it's told, but the easiest way to say it is it takes place inside Hitler's mind. Um, and it's 
very disturbing, twisted, wicked, nasty stuff. Uh, but I worked very closely with the director, Barry Hershey, in sort of unfolding his psychological views on the subject, um, which was uh, very emotionally intense to, to, to get involved with. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's, um, I, is the film viewable? Can you find it these days? Have you, you know, where, I think it, that you probably can find it somewhere. Yeah. It's a really, really, really a very peculiar and interesting exploration. It's really a psychological study. It's, um, of, of, uh, of the subject and it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a really weird, weird film, but it was, um, something very emotional to, to score. And, um, I felt I had to push myself into some, you know, real risky areas with it too. I you know like Alien Resurrection essentially kind of launched you into doing some really pretty cool genre score. I mean, my personal favorite is 13 Ghosts. You know, you've done Legion, which is another really cool film. Uh, I think two Texas Chainsaw movies and you did uh, the, the cult series, The Following. I mean, where, where do you think this kind of demand for your darker abilities came for? came from that's a good question i mean you know i'm i'm with 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 do the universe i'll probably be doing comedy for the next 10 years and I'm, I'm ready to laugh a bit um i do find the horror i i do like doing it but it does take a bit of a, a toll on me because i i get so involved in it um and the comedy it's a lot easier to, to wrap up a day of writing and go take the dog to the beach and play with a tennis ball you're not so you know that, that when I'm writing horror scores, it really gets in them every cell in me. Um, I try to, I, I try to scare myself. You know, um, which isn't easy. I don't really scare much. Um, I, I, I and you know, so I, I, I think in Thirteen Ghosts, you know, you have the the jackal, and and I actually got myself scared, you know, with that character. Um, so yeah, it's um, it's it, but it is. It does take. It is. It is. It is a much tougher experience. It it has a lot more wear and tear on the composer psychologically. For me, at least, it does. I I, get, I do get very involved. Now you've done some really pretty amazing epic scores, and Eric is back, and he says it's uh, one he really greatly enjoyed was Gods and Generals. Now, could you discuss your work on it, your influences, the collaboration, and if you had to come back and write more music when the directors came out and even extended it even more? I think the director's cut um, was what we actually recorded too, and so then they pared it down, then they just expanded it back up to the director's cut. Um, and that was a job where, of course, Randy Edelman, uh, amazing composer, Randy did the, the first film and then couldn't do the second film. Um, and so I was brought, I came in and um, incorporated uh, several themes that Randy had into the film. And um, so I, I, I don't, you know, I, th I think it's sort of a mishmash of, of myself and Randy in there. Um, but, but, but that was a, that was another one where um, it was exciting to work with the, the era. Um, Patty Maloney from the Chieftains played Ilan Pipe on it. And um, that was working with Patty was, uh, you know, sort of a lifelong dream of uh, being a big Chieftains fan and un see, sort of seeing how he worked musically and how he thought of things and actually going out to a pub with him too was pretty fun. Now, you know, I keep running into composers who, really credit you uh, for helping them in their career. Um, and again, as a composer who was helped by some really distinguished people, how important do you think it is for to pay it forward for composers to kind of really notice what people are doing, assistance, whatever, and to make, make sure that there's another generation going on? Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just fun. Um, there's, I, that, there is a lot of composers that, that I that have worked with me and um, are really having great careers today. And, and that's wonderful. It was, I think it really goes back to James Newton Howard is, you know, I, I said, James, you, you helped me so much. What do I do? And he said, just do it, do the same thing. So that's pretty much it. But I think I would have done it. I, I love doing it. Um, and um, so those are some of the most meaningful relationships in my life. Um, and I love music. And I think that, anything that I can do that just brings 
it's just a, a great musical experience. So, so someone else learning to write and really coming into their own as a composer, um, that's just a great musical experience to me. So uh, I guess I'm just here to bring, I just like bringing music to the world. Is that, I know that sounds kind of dorky and corny, but, but maybe that's just what I feel. How um, easy, what, or I mean, what was the experience like of doing this massive score? If anything, I think it's even better performed than, but, uh, than Do America, which obviously I love. But this is definitely, it's got a great, super lush, super emotional sound. Uh, was this relatively easy to do, or what were the, the difficulties? Well, um, when I first saw some of the film, I was just amazed. It, it was, I guess... When, when, as a composer, when I see a film and I look at it, it's almost like, um, it's almost like a campsite or a, a, it's like w this, this palette, this place, this canvas where you're going to get to, to do something. And I looked at this and I was like, oh my goodness, this is, this is just incredible. Um, and so I just have to say thanks to, to Mike and, and, um, for creating that that palette, that place where it just, it just craved score and it just craved all these different tones. Um, it's just a beautifully constructed film. And um, I just rolled right into it. I didn't really have to think much about what I was going to do. It just seemed the film knew what it needed me to do. It didn't, it wasn't, it took a lot of time to do it, but I didn't have to get in there. Sometimes you get, I work on a film and I have to get in there. And I feel like I'm getting in there and with a crowbar and ch changing this scene to feel like this and sort of getting in there and doing heavy lifting to move emotions from place to place so that I can create uh, a more effective emotional flow. But none of that, this film is so wonderfully constructed that I literally just needed to augment and put music where the film said it needed it. I mean, I know that sounds corny to say the film says it needs it, but films do. They do. They literally, if I hear, if I'm working on a film and I, I watch a scene where there isn't score yet, it's just, it's like a blank canvas. It's just waiting for paint. Now, you and Mike have actually played live together. What was, oh, yeah. what has that experience been like? And where can, when can we see you on stage together again? Wow. Well, I think the last time we played live was Largo pre pandemic with Sean Watkins, um, uh, uh, Ed Helms was there and John C. Riley, and, um, some other guests. Uh, and, and so we love to play, we love bluegrass. Mike is an amazing bass player. And so when things pop up, uh, you know, uh, there are times when this bluegrass stuff happens and, uh, we just roll with it. So I think I'm going to play, at a bar called uh, um, Bigfoot West, maybe in the next Sunday. I love. I like to get out and play bluegrass. Where Where is Bigfoot West? In Culver City. Ah, very quick. Okay, well, we we want to know about it. I'll I'll get the information out there. Yeah, get the info. I, you know, it'll it, it'll probably be like a last minute, just sort of go down and join some friends down there. But um, but I do I do show up at Bigfoot West from time to time, and um, bark out my bluegrass stuff. Now, you know, when, when uh, Do America came out, I think it was almost amazing to see the great reviews that film got. You know, it was an unexpected box office hit. And, uh, I mean, Do the Universe is awesome. You know, you can fight if it's, it's, if it's an even better film, which I think it is. But were you just surprised by how great the reviews are and just the response that this has gotten from Paramount Plus? It feels really good. Um and part of it is just really an honest desire to to bring entertainment, to bring something really funny to people, you know. And it feels really good that I know that there's a lot of people really just laughing and that really dig it. And that's just that feels really nice. Um, and the other thing is is to know that we're that, that, that what I think is funny, I'm not out of it. I'm not, you know, I don't I didn't know when I was sitting there if I if I was like you know the the, the places where I was putting stuff it was making me laugh more and more you know, was my son going to laugh? Who's 18 and his friends are going to laugh and, and they're laughing, they're laughing. They're really laughing. So, um, yeah, it was, is it relief and, and wonderful. 
And uh, to wrap up the show, where, where do these characters, they've, they've destroyed America, done the universe, where, where do they go next? What's head for you and Mike together? I have no idea where Mike will take the boys. But I know there is, there's a series has been announced. And so there's going to be a lot of adventures there. Um, who knows, you know, um, what, what other thing they could do after doing the universe. Um, uh, something fun. You know, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be some great stuff in the series. I haven't seen a lot of it, but I'm sure there's going to be really cool stuff coming. Well, John, I want to thank you so much for joining us at Film Music Live. I want you all to watch Beavis and Butthead do the universe on Paramount Plus with its soundtrack soon to arrive digitally on LP. Um, and big thanks to La Land Records who have just released the collector's edition of Beavis and Butthead do America. Um and thanks to Mark Northam, our producer, Dale Turner, Mark Banning, and Mary Grace Oglesby at Costa Communications. I'll see you on the next Film Music Live on Saturday, July 9th at 1 o'clock as Christopher Leonard flies again with the savage superheroes of The Boys. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, John. Thanks, everybody.